All right, we're in 2 Timothy, we're in chapter 1. We're going to look at verses 8 through 18. In other words, we're going to complete our chapter. There really was enough in this for me to have divided it into more than one study, but I chose to give you actually a single study through this. And um, in some ways I regret that because ordinarily I would have stopped at verse 12 and then picked up at verse 13. But today we're going to do both, uh, both sections that I originally would have divided this into, kind of compiling them. And so we'll begin with verse 8 here in 1 Timothy, uh, rather 2 Timothy chapter 1. We'll read verses 8 through 12, and then we'll move into verse 13 to the end of the chapter. So let's read together in 2 Timothy chapter 1 at verse 8, and I'll read to verse 12, and we'll get into our study. Paul writes, Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel, according to the power of God, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began, but has now been revealed by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, to which I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher of the Gentiles. For this reason, I also suffered these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed to him until that day. So allow me to once again lay a foundation in as much as I wasn't here able to build on it last time. Um, I'll pick up where I had left off. So I'm going to lay another foundation for you as we look at this portion of Scripture together. I would remind you that the Apostle Paul is writing what is called the second letter to Timothy. The second letter to Timothy is Paul's final letter. It's the last letter that he writes that is found in our New Testament. He's writing to a young man by the name of Timothy. Timothy is a pastor. A pastor who was left behind in the city of Ephesus in order that he might pastor the church there in Ephesus. The city of Ephesus is in what is called Asia Minor. It's in modern Turkey. And the city of Ephesus was during its day what would be called a cosmopolitan city. It was a port city. It was a city that was known for a variety of things, including a heavy influence of idolatry. It was known for its immorality. It was also known for its magic, its occult practices. And so Timothy is pastoring a church in a city that is very evil, very large, and very opposed to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul had been preaching there, but as he had preached there in the city of Ephesus and ministered in the city of Ephesus, there had been a growing opposition. And so ultimately, Paul had left, and Timothy was remaining behind to make sure that the church was uh, built up. It was taught well and all. And so now Paul is at the end of his life. He's writing a letter to a young pastor, and he's encouraging this young man to remain strong. You see, Timothy will be tempted to compromise his faith, and Timothy will be tempted to water down the message of the gospel because the cost of remaining faithful is very great. Discouragement is also very great. Because in the midst of all that he's doing, that the Lord is blessing, where good is, evil will also be. And so where God begins to progress through the message, opposition will continue to grow. And so Timothy could be, become discouraged through all of this. And so Paul is writing to him to encourage him. He's he's writing this letter because Paul is reminding him that he's gone through very many things himself. He's writing from a cold jail cell. Is awaiting trial before Caesar, and, and uh, Paul is ready to die. He's preparing to die. So this faithful apostle who had traveled for many years, who had been preaching and teaching and planted many churches, and many people have come to faith through Christ, to, uh, faith in Christ through him, this faithful apostle is now at the end of his ministry. And as one who has remained faithful to God, he can write to Timothy and he can speak with credibility. He can speak with experience. You know, we we have hearts that, 
you know, when you're young in the Lord, you want to be an encourager and all. And I've always appreciated the younger believers who, who want to continue to bring encouragement into my life. And as a young believer, I wanted to be an encourager to, to those who had gone on before me. And, and encouragement is a good thing in the body of Christ. And, and yet at the same time, you know, when I've been encouraged by those who've been in ministry longer than I, it, it carries with it a note of credibility. And the Apostle Paul had credibility, and he's alluding to that throughout this letter. You see, he's at the end of his journey. He can speak with, with experience, and he can help this young guy to understand what ministry is all about. Because Paul had remained faithful to the Lord. He's going to say in chapter 4 that he has fought the good fight, that he has finished the race, and that he has kept the faith, and that he confidently is awaiting a crown of righteousness. You see, Paul had ministered for over 30 years. He traveled exhaustively in order to preach the gospel. When you read the book of Acts, you have a detailed uh, explanation of many of his journeys. And, and the book of Acts speaks of his ministry trials as well as his triumphs. And Paul makes it very clear in his writings that his goal was to, to take the gospel throughout the world, and he did so tirelessly. When he was writing to the Romans in chapter 15, verse 20, he said, I have made it my aim to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build on another man's foundation. Fact is, with all of his accomplishments and all the faithfulness that he's shown to the Lord, in the end, Paul was abandoned. In verse 15, we'll see that in chapter 1, when he simply says, This you know, that all those in Asia have turned away from me. In chapter 4, he's going to speak of a man by the name of Demas, and he's going to simply say, Demas has forsaken me. He'll go on later on in the same chapter, and he'll say, All those in Asia have turned away from me. And so this is a man who made it his chief aim to take the gospel throughout the world, preaching Christ when Jesus' name had not been mentioned, where the gospel had not entered. And now he's in a jail cell. He's in a cold cell. He's been abandoned by everybody. And he's encouraging Timothy. You see, Timothy could be tempted to lose heart, and he could be tempted to lose hope. Paul's about to die. And the world that he's been ministering to is deeply opposed to Christianity. And it could seem that there's nothing that can be done to overcome this growing and creeping darkness. You could feel the same way if you're a strong believer in Christ. And if you really do believe that the message of the gospel is true, and if you really do believe that you should communicate this message to others or else they're lost, you could feel the same way. Because every day, it seems more and more evident that the world that we live in is rejecting Christ. More and more people are, are saying that they're not Christians or Jewish or, or even Muslim, for that matter. They're simply spiritual. They don't even identify with any kind of faith of any sort because they believe that their own beliefs is enough for them. And so we're living in a time where there's a lot of negativity. There's a lot of things that are being said about Christianity that isn't true. There's a lot of things that are said about believers that simply are not true. And you could get to the point where you think that this world is completely against us and there's nothing we can do. There was a, a man, he was an archdeacon, his name was Athanasius, and he was standing up against the heresy that was growing in, in the church that related to the, uh, the deity of Jesus Christ. And there were people who were standing up saying and teaching that Jesus Christ was a creation of God. And Athanasius had stood in opposition to that, and he was when he was championing what Scripture says pertaining to Christ, that Christ is God incarnate. And the church was being, in terms of its higher echelon of the theologians and those who had established and were presenting the faith, they were being, at that time, influenced by a heresy that had entered into the church, and many of the bishops were beginning to embrace this particular heresy called Arianism. And what happened as it had begun is Athanasius was the one, really the loudest voice in opposition to this growing heresy. And finally, on one occasion, someone said to him, Athanasius, Athanasius, the world is against you. And Athanasius' reply very famously is stated that he said, no, it's not the world against Athanasius. It's Athanasius against the world. And that's what we're called to, an awareness that though the darkness continues to creep in, 
We have the light of the gospel, and we hold fast to the truth. And that's what Paul is simply saying to this young man, this young man named Timothy. He's encouraging him and using himself as a credible witness as to what it means to pay a price to speak the truth in, in an age that rejects it. Paul was a man who understood struggle. He understood difficulty, so he could write from that, from that perspective. He, he had his own share of struggles. He had his own times of trial and despair. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 8 through 10, Paul said this. He said, we do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened beyond measure above strength, so that we despaired, even of life. Yes, we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead, who delivered us from so great a death, and does deliver us in who we trust that he will still deliver us. So he said, I've gone through my times, my struggles, and the difficulties in life, and I have a God who delivers. He did it in the past, he's doing it now, and he'll do it into the future. So Timothy appears to be discouraged. So Paul began with an exhortation, and he had said to him in verse 6 of chapter 1, I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. So Paul had begun with this word, fan up the gift that is in you. It's not that the flame is extinguished, but it's very low. It needs to be rekindled. Paul is about to be put to death. He's ready to depart planet Earth. Timothy must carry on where Paul left off. And he cannot do this in his own strength. You cannot fight a spiritual battle with carnal weapons. You can't have a victory if you're doing it in your own flesh and in your own strength. That's why he's to rekindle the flame. He needs to return to his first love. He's telling him in verse 7, God hasn't given to us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. God hasn't given to us a, a fear, but God has given to us the, the tools that are necessary for us to be able to go out, engage the enemy, and be victorious. We have power. We have love. We have spiritual discipline, and this is all necessary. And we also need to have these things in our life so we can live out this message that we're giving to others. And so with all of that, Paul is moving on now into verse 8 to continue what he's saying, and he says, Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God. And so he says, Therefore, do not be ashamed. Now remember when we began the study, I mentioned to you that the key word in 2 Timothy is the word ashamed. And he's saying, do not be ashamed. Don't, don't be ashamed of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to remain bold and strong in the face of opposition, is what he's saying. Paul repeats the word being ashamed several times. He exhorts Timothy to be courageous and faithful to Jesus and, and Jesus' message, as well as to the people of the Lord. So he's saying, do not shrink back from sharing the testimony of the Lord. Don't be ashamed of the testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, some people today are ashamed of the message of the gospel because it seems simplistic. I mean, we, we speak to people and we say, listen, the reason there is evil is because we are by nature evil. And immediately when you say that, you got people who will argue with you and they'll say, oh no, people aren't evil, people are inherently good. They will argue the goodness of man. And those who have a tendency of arguing the goodness of man are probably those who have never had a child. Because when you have a baby, you discover the man is evil. You discover that. You discover how evil they are, their little nature, their monsters. I mean, <laughs> when they're six or eight months old, they would kill you if they were big enough to do it. They're monsters. They have their mother's nature, and that, that's just a fact. <laughs> Amen, men. Amen. Actually, they have what is called the Adamic nature. We men have given it. We are the ones who are, are transmitting it. Uh, Adamic nature, fallen nature. And, 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 and there's this argument that they're actually good when in fact they're not. They have to be trained to be good. We have to be trained out of evil. And everybody knows that except for those who, for whatever reason, have rejected that. And so we preach a message. We say, listen, your, your, your nature is evil, but God loves man so much that God did something about that. He, he, he determined to rescue us. We were lost in sin and walking in darkness. 
And God has chosen to rescue us. And here you are trying to figure out how to be rescued when in fact God has already told you how to be rescued. But sadly, sometimes they don't hear because there's no preacher. And then sometimes they don't hear because the preacher is mixing up the message and not giving it clearly. And thus he brings his own opinions into what the author of that message intended to communicate because for him it's difficult. And there are those who, who want to change the message to make it more understandable to man, when in fact, we just need to present it, and yet the intellectual will listen and say, that's just too simple, that's simple-minded. Are you telling me there's such a thing as a God, that man by nature is fallen, and that someone has to ransom or rescue him, and that if that person, all he has to do, all she has to do, is just, just say, oh, forgive me, and it's all done, and a brand new life is given. People will argue about that because it sounds simplistic. There's no depth to that. They're not understanding what it means. They're just arguing on the surface. But in fact, God is the author. He knows how to, how, to, how to heal us. He's the one who gave to us the manual that speaks of how to repair. And he's the one who does that. He's the one who does the work for us. And yet people are, are look at that message as too simple and all. It's a message that is confounding to some, intellectually shallow to others. In 1 Corinthians 1, 17 and 18, Paul said it like this. He said, Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with the wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. The, the, the preaching of the message of the gospel is foolishness. It's, it's imbecilic. It's moronic. It makes no sense. Uh, the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God. They are foolishness to him. Neither can he know them, for they are spiritually discerned. Paul later on says in chapter 2, verse 14, the natural man, the unspiritual man, the unregenerated man, the man devoid of the Holy Spirit, rejects. He doesn't welcome it in. He does, re he does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. Why? Their foolishness, the word foolishness, again, moronic, imbecilic. It makes no sense to them. Why? Because you're trying to figure out the Almighty God. The Almighty God has to reveal himself because we would not find him. Surely he is a God who hides himself. And if he determines to tell us who he is, then we need to listen to him when he speaks, and that's the gospel. And so Paul said that this message of the cross, this message of the gospel, is, is something that is... Foolishness to those who are perishing, but to the ones who are being saved, it's the power of God. And we need to understand that. Timothy, you need to remember that it's a message that will save those who believe. So continue preaching that message. In 1 Corinthians 1, 21 through 24, Paul goes on to say, For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. Jews request a sign. Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. To the Jews, a stumbling block. To the Greeks, foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Timothy, do not be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Understand that the gospel is God's message to man and present it as such. Share this message with confidence. Trust that the Lord will use it to reach other people. That's a big problem we're having in the church today because it is confrontational. Listen, remember this always. Truth is confrontational. Real truth confronts the error. It always does. That's what it does. That's why Jesus Christ was crucified. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me, and immediately the intellectuals say, no, wait a minute, you've got all these people throughout history, and you're saying to me, that's the problem. So I'm not here to try and explain God. I'm here to proclaim God. It's his word that we embrace. And Paul is simply saying that to Timothy, and he's saying, share this message with confidence. Trust that the Lord will use this message, Timothy, to reach other people. You are in the city of Ephesus. Highly sophisticated city, a city like San Francisco, a city like New York City, 
a city like LA, San Diego, any mega uh, mega uh, in the world, uh, it, it's like a Paris or whatever. It's Rome. It's 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 a city that is filled with with not only population but with darkness. And you can look at it and you can you can say, how are we going to reach these people? So preach the message, preach the word, in season and out of season. Convict, repent, uh, reprove. Uh, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. Continue to do that, Timothy. Hold fast to these things. You see, Timothy, remember that I'm in jail. Remember that Nero is about to have me executed. I'm ready to depart. I'm ready to be with the Lord. There's a crown of righteousness that's awaiting me. I have fought the good fight, Timothy. But this message I'm giving to you is intended to continue till Christ returns. So be faithful in preaching this message. Listen, college student, high school student, when you're in class and you have a teacher that is in opposition to the gospel and ridicules believers, don't be intimidated. They're lost. I spoke in between uh, services today to a young lady who said, Pastor, can you help me when it comes to dealing with an atheistic professor that I have in college? She said to me, he, he asked about Christianity and he began. She said he's an atheist evangelist. He's trying to evangelize the entire class into atheism. What should I do? So I encouraged her. I said, get, you, know, you can do some studying. You know, get, uh, get some books on apologetics and be prepared and go into class and, and, and be ready to give an answer. The professor said to her, you know, young lady, you need to learn how to defend your faith better. I said, don't be ashamed at that. Use that as a challenge and take some time and read up and, and learn some arguments. I said, that's a great way to grow in your understanding of the things of the Lord. Don't be intimidated just because the world screams, because the world screams because it's hit. I say this often, but you throw a rock into a pack of dogs and the one that barks got hit. Be aware of that. So when you have somebody who's evangelizing, don't let the world out evangelize the Christian. Just know what you believe and share it. Speak it with confidence. Take courage. Be ready to share what you know. And when the opportunity presents itself, do so. I did that as a young college student. I'd be in class. I didn't always go to Christian colleges. I went to several universities that were not. And I'd be in the class. I'd be in the social studies or the psychology or whatever the class may be. And the professor would be a uh, uh, an atheist, uh, an agnostic, and, and, and I just took opportunity. And yeah, I was ridiculed. I was ridiculed. I was made to feel stupid. But guess what? It's the truth of the gospel, and God has a way of using that word. Just speak the truth and take courage. In Psalm 40, verse 9 and 10, it says, I have proclaimed the good news of righteousness in the great assembly. Indeed, I do not restrain my lips, O Lord. You yourself know. I have not hidden your righteousness within my heart. I've declared your faithfulness and your salvation. I have not concealed your loving kindness and your truth from the great assembly. I haven't held back, in other words. In Psalm 119, verse 46, I will speak of your testimonies also before kings, and I will not be ashamed. So he says, don't be ashamed of this message, verse 8, nor of, of, of me, his prisoner. Share with me in the sufferings for the gospel. So don't be ashamed of identifying with Paul or other believers. Paul's imprisonment could cause Timothy to fear to identify with Paul and would even help to keep him from coming to see him. Paul was experiencing what he had been prepared for. Jesus had taught that believers would endure persecution. Paul was doing just that. Paul's mindset concerning his imprisonment should be an example to Timothy. Timothy could see what Paul was going through and take courage. In 1 Peter 4, 16, the apostle Peter said, if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. You know, the interesting thing as you look at this is how Paul uh, makes this statement. Again, in verse eight, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner. Notice he didn't say, I'm a prisoner of Rome, or I am a prisoner of Caesar. He said, I am God's prisoner. In Ephesians 3, verse 1, for this reason, I, Paul, am the prisoner of Christ Jesus. Ephesians 4, verse 1, he speaks as a prisoner for the Lord. I may be in prison, 
but I'm not man's prisoner. And God is my comfort and God is my strength and God protects me. Like it says in Psalm 62, verse 2, he only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be greatly moved. So share with me, he says. Share with me in the sufferings for the gospel. Suffering for the sake of the Lord is part of being a believer. Don't be, dis uh, don't be surprised. Don't shrink back. Don't shrink back from identifying with Christ. Don't shrink back from identifying with Christ's people. Don't shrink back from being identified with his message. You see, as he speaks here, notice this in verse 8 with me. He says, share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God. Now, that's interesting. What he's saying is, listen, Timothy, no matter what you're going through, God is with you and he will strengthen you in the midst of it. God enables you to endure suffering. Paul makes it clear that those who are subjected to trials because of the gospel are able to look for divine strength to uphold them. And he encourages Timothy to endure those trials, relying on God's strength and not on his own strength. You see, in the end, Timothy being willing to share in such sufferings is one of the ways that demonstrates that he has genuine faith. Remember in Matthew 10, verse 22, Jesus gave us a promise that we don't want to ask for. You don't find it in your promise boxes that you get in the bookstore. In Matthew 10, 22, you will be hated by all for my name's sake. That's a promise. But he goes on to say, but he who endures to the end will be saved. Timothy, hold on and stay true. Notice in verse 9 how he says, who has saved us, and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. He saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works. So notice with me, it says, who has saved us? It is God who saved and called us. And the gospel declares the holiness of God. Salvation comes before the call to serve. And the message reveals that God is holy. And because God is holy, Timothy, live out a holy life. A.W. Tozer is one of my favorite devotional writers. And Tozer said this, you can be sure the Holy Spirit never enters a man and lets him live like the world. That's true, that's, that's good, that's good. The Holy Spirit does not provoke me to be carnal, the Holy Spirit gives me power to be holy, to be separated, to live a life that is identifiably different. And it's the gospel that declares the holiness of God. But it is also the gospel that calls us to live a separated life. In 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16, as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, because it is written, be holy, for I am holy. Ephesians 4.1 says, as a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling that you have received. So notice he speaks concerning this holy God who's called us with a holy calling. But notice also in verse 9 how he says this, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. That is where a lot of people have problems today because we try to work our way into heaven. We try to have a, a righteous appearance, but in reality, it's just dressing up the outside. It's putting, it's putting lipstick on a pig, if you will. I, when I dress my outside, but my inside hasn't been changed. It's, it's, I'm, 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 only, I'm only becoming a hypocrite because I'm trying to appear in one way when in fact, inside, I'm entirely different. When I was in the army many years ago, now I, I uh, there was a, a new show at that time, which is ancient history for many of you now, but it was a new show at that time. It was called Kung Fu, starring Raul Reese from Calvary Chapel Gold Springs. <laughs> and it was called Kung Fu. And uh, you know that you may or may not know this, but the martial arts and things like that in the 50s and 60s did not really exist. You did not see it, it, many things related to karate, Kung Fu, Judo. You never saw anything like that because the, the United States was built on, on, on the martial art of boxing, right? So, so whoever really watched these foreign things, you know, where people would 
throw people and jujitsu and things like that. That was foreign to us. So now it's 1970, 71, and there's a new program called Kung Fu. And I'm thinking, well, well that's interesting. You know, I, I don't know anything about that. So I started to watch it whenever I had opportunity. And you've got this guy, Shaolin Monk, you know all the story of it. And he's walking around and he's got these saffron robes and shaved his head and, and he goes, you know, he's a man of peace and, and he goes into, into the West and beats everybody up. So that was interesting. The man of peace who kicked everybody's tails all over the place. But anyway, as I was watching it, I was a new Christian and I thought, wow, look how humble he is. Because he had a shaved head and he had this saffron robe. So I, so I tried to become humble on the outside. I didn't put on a saffron robe. They, they wouldn't let me in the army. But I, I did walk around with my head bowed low. And I'd walk by people like that. And that lasted about three days, you know, because I didn't have that. It was all outside. It wasn't inside. So a long time ago, as a brand new believer, I began to realize that I can put on the face of a humble person. But if the heart is not broken and conforming to Christ, it's just a show. It's a charade and all of that. So I need the power of the Holy Spirit to transform me. It's not something you do on your own. It's something that you trust the Lord to do within you. But you seek him that he might have his way. And we need to understand that salvation is something that is, like he said in verse 9, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace. So it's a free gift from God. And it is available to any who would in faith call upon him. And so, Timothy, you're going to have opportunity to take this message to a, a city that rejects Christ, but this is a message that is for everybody. He saved us. He called us with a holy calling, but not according to our works. I was speaking to somebody, and perhaps this may offend some of you. Please let me finish what I'm saying before you stone me. But I was speaking to somebody one time many years ago, and my own personal religious background and faith trip was I was raised in the Catholic Church. You may have been, you may not have been. I was. And so I was baptized when I was an infant. I, I received First Communion when I was eight years old. I received confirmation at 13. Um, I had those sacraments and all. I expected to have the sacrament of marriage, etc. I knew my Catholic theology, at least through the catechism. I understood it and all. And so I was raised in a, in a home with a mother who uh, led the, uh, in, at the St. Pius X Church. My mother was involved with the uh, organization of women there who uh, used to do the rosary, and my mom would do that. She taught us to do rosaries. My mom taught me Catholic faith from the time I was very small. My mom taught me to pray for St. Anthony, because Saint a to St. Anthony, because there was one particular thing I would pray, St. Anthony, St. Anthony, please come around, for there is something that cannot be found, because I was always losing my keys, and my mom taught me what you need to do is that. So I was raised with the traditions of, of, of speaking to others and not necessarily to God. My mom said to me, son, you know how that when you want something and your dad's not around, how uh, you come and speak to me and I bring it to your dad? And I said, yes. And she said, well, you, that's how it is with Mary. You come to Mary and you ask her and Mary will bring it to, to Jesus. So my mother was devoted to Mary and she tried to teach me to be the same. So I didn't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. I would speak to Anthony or I'd speak to Mary. That's how I was raised and I thought that that was okay. I thought that was what God would say. After all, my mother wouldn't lie to me and that's how I grew up. And my mom did the best that she could to try and teach me to, to venerate and respect and all of that. And, and that's, that's my religious upbringing. And so I get saved. And, and now I'm saying, oh, wait a minute. The things that mama, mama taught me are not, not found in the Bible. And, and so I'm starting to grow. And now I'm beginning to learn more. And I'm beginning to teach. And now I'm speaking to somebody I love very dearly who is a, a devout Catholic. And, and I, I say to them, I said, you know, you love Mary, right? And he says, yes. I say to him, do you, uh, do you think that she is sinless? Because we were taught that she was immaculate. Is she sinless? He says, yes, she has no sin. I said, let me ask you a question. Please answer me. I said, if Mary has no sin, why didn't they crucify her? Why didn't they put her on the cross and save Jesus from having to do that? Because what God desires is a perfect sacrifice. Thus, if Mary is without sin, why was she not put on the cross? And why was Jesus? 
It's because she said, my soul rejoices in God, my Savior. And only saviors, uh, only sinners need saviors. On one occasion, um, it's found in John chapter 2, uh, the scripture speaks concerning the fact that Jesus is at a wedding in Cana of Galilee. And, and she, Mary, his mother, approaches him and says to him, they have no wine. And Jesus' response is, woman, what has that got to do with me? And then later on, she walks up to the people who are there who are supposed to provide that, and she says this. She says, whatever he says to you, do it. And that's what we're supposed to do. Whatever he says to you, do it. So when you preach the gospel, you're preaching the gospel concerning a righteous Savior who died on the cross for sinners, for us. Jesus did that, and that's how we're saved. And it's not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration, the renewing of the Holy Spirit. For it's grace, by grace that you're saved through faith, and that not of yourself, it's a gift of God, and not of works, lest any man should boast. And that's what Paul is speaking about here when he speaks concerning the fact that we've received God's unmerited favor. And this grace, he says in verse 9, was given to us in Christ Jesus. You see, and notice how he says it was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. That means that salvation is not an afterthought. It's God's plan from the beginning. And because of this, our works could have nothing to do with our own salvation. This is something that he planned before we even existed. Before time began, reminds Timothy that works never produce salvation. Salvation came solely as a result of God's loving plans from eternity. So this plan, verse 10, has now been revealed by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. This has been revealed by the appearing, notice the appearing of our Savior. This grace has been given to us in Jesus before time was, but it's revealed in his incarnation. John 1.17 says the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So God's grace has now been clearly revealed through what Jesus has done for us. Notice verse 10. He has abolished death and brought us life in his gospel. Abolished. The word abolished speaks of rendering something inoperative. The sting has been removed is what he's saying. I've uh, done a number of funerals over the years. I've been in ministry a long time. The very first funeral that I ever officiated, I was about 28 years old, 29 years old at the time. And the funeral was for a man who was a pedophile. He had molested his own daughter. The man was also an unrepentant gambler and alcoholic. And at his funeral, his friends showed up who were prostitutes and, and gamblers and, and uh, druggies and you name it. That was my very first funeral that I ever did to share with a group of people. Now, when I was like, you know, in sin and unrepentant sin, and I remember my mom when I grew up, she used to speak of prostitutes. And some of you have heard this before. Or maybe you heard this uh, as a kid yourself. My mom would refer to prostitutes as ladies in red. I had no clue what that meant. I didn't know what that meant. But in fact, many of the prostitutes would wear red, very bright. And so there were ladies in the funeral wearing red with bright li red lipstick. It was amazing. You know, I, I, I thought, wow. And, and I, I cannot give hope. I cannot preach a word of hope to, uh, of that man. I can't say, oh, God is going to let him into heaven because he died an unrepentant sinner. The second person that I, I, I did a funeral for was a man who killed himself. Those are my first two funerals. And I began to learn a long time ago that, that in Christ, death has lost its sting. I discovered a long time ago that when you're right with the Lord Jesus Christ, I can preach a, a word of hope to a congregation. I can say, this brother here, this sister here, 
uh, has gone on, but she's gone on to glory. She's with the Lord Jesus Christ because of what God has done. When I brought my, my father to faith in Christ, when I was 20 years old and, and he was there at the kitchen table with my mom and, and I led him in a prayer to receive Christ. Uh, many years later, I was able to bury this man, my father and my mother. And I was able, able to say, you know, I, I never said goodbye to them. I'm simply saying, I'll see you later because they're with the Lord because death, where is your sting? Where is your sting? And that comes through the gospel. That comes through the gospel. That's the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. In 1 Corinthians 15, verses 54 and 55, when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O grave, where is your victory? The story is told of a father and a son who were taking a drive one afternoon when a bee flew in the window. The little boy was allergic to bee stings. And when that bee flew into the window, the boy began to panic as the bee began to fly around inside the car. And seeing the fear on his son's face, the father reached out and he caught the bee in his hand. And then he opened his hand and the bee began to buzz around again. And once again, the little boy began to panic and the father reached over to his son and he opened his hand, showing him the stinger that was still in his palm. And he said to him, relax, son, I took the sting. The bee can't hurt you anymore. And Jesus Christ took the sting for us. And he's saying, calm down, my son. Calm down, my daughter. I took the sting. He can't hurt you anymore. That's the gospel. That's part of the message that we give to others. That's a message of grace. God has saved us. And that's why we have hope. And he made this decision to do so before time began. In verse 11, he says, to which I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher of the Gentiles. Even though I'm in prison, I know who I am. I am in prison, that's true. But Timothy, I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and I'm a teacher of the Gentiles. It's been said, you can take a man's liberty, but you can never take his freedom. And when you're free in the Lord Jesus Christ, though you may be some situation like Paul was, that he's in a jail cell, a prison cell, awaiting death, he still knew who he was. He never forgot who he was. And he's telling this young man, don't forget who you are. Because Timothy, though I'm here in chains, if you will, though I'm here in prison and, 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 and I'm locked up and all, I'm still a, a preacher. I'm still an apostle. I'm still a teacher. For this reason, he says in verse 12, I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I'm not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed to him until that day. For this reason, I'm in prison. I'm only guilty of faithfully fulfilling my calling. I'm still doing it faithfully. And I trust the Lord to work through all that I go through for his glory. And because of this, I may suffer, but I'm not ashamed. I'm not ashamed of suffering for the cause of Jesus and Timothy, neither should you. He says in verse 12, I know whom I have believed and I am persuaded that he's able. Interesting, he's saying, I know whom I've believed, not simply the truth of the gospel, but the one who gave that gospel. I've entrusted my soul to him. Into his hand, I've commended my spirit. I've committed my life to him. And I know he's able to keep me completely. And on that day, I will see him. And the crown of life will be given to me. And so because of this, verse 13, hold fast the pattern of sound words which you have heard from me in faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. That good thing which was committed to you, keep by the Holy Spirit who dwells in us. This you know, that all those in Asia have turned away from me, among whom are Phagellus and Hermogenes. The Lord grant mercy to the household of Onesiphorus, for he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chain. 
But when he arrived in Rome, he sought me out very zealously and found me. The Lord grant to him that he may find mercy from the Lord in that day. And you know very well how many ways he ministered to me at Ephesus. And so we'll roll into a conclusion by looking at these last few verses. Notice in verses 13 and 14 how he says, hold fast the pattern of sound words. Hold fast, hold tightly to this form of doctrine and teaching that forms a life. It is healthy. It produces a healthy spiritual life. And Timothy, I'm giving you an order that you need to follow. I have laid the outline out for you. So steadfastly hold to the outline of healthy teaching. This gospel is what has strengthened me in my difficult times. So you need to hold tightly to it also. I'm about to depart. I'm going to be with the Lord, but I'm leaving you behind to carry on his work. So do so faithfully. Hold fast to the message of grace that you have in Christ. Guard that gospel. You have responsibility of transmitting this healthy teaching. It's a message that sets people free. It's a message that heals broken lives. Teach that message faithfully. God's word is to be received by faith and acted upon. And when it is received by faith and acted upon, it brings healing. There's a, a psalm, Psalm 19, verse 7, that says, the law of the Lord is perfect. That word perfect means it lacks nothing. The law of the Lord is complete. It lacks nothing. Converting the soul. The word converting in the original language speaks of healing or refreshing. God's word is perfectly able to heal any broken soul. God's word is able to bring comfort when man's word never will. It's one thing when you bury your father and someone says, I'm sorry for your loss. It's another thing when you bury your father and someone says, one day you'll be with him in paradise. Because God's word gives us hope for the future. Man does their best to encourage you, but God's word heals you. And that's why we give his word. That's why we don't spend time talking about the latest philosophy or the latest thing that's coming down the road for people to be aware of. If you know the word of God, no matter what you encounter, you will overcome because the Lord Jesus Christ will give you direction and power to do so. And Paul is about to die. He's about to lose his head. He's not about to give a pep talk to Timothy. He's saying, you need to hold fast to the pattern of sound words. You need to remain faithful to that. And by the way, it may end up with you losing your head. But guess what? You close your eyes here and you look at Jesus there. So hang on to his word. Don't let it go. Do not be ashamed of the gospel. It is the message of God that, that guards you, and, and it is the power of the Holy Spirit that strengthens you from the inside. And we need spiritual strength because the spiritual attacks that occur are difficult to endure. Notice what he says in verse 15, this you know. All those in Asia turned away. Asia, what he's speaking about Asia there is not in China or Japan. He's speaking of, of Turkey. It's called Asia Minor. He's speaking of to, uh, the, to the north of, of Israel in what is modern Turkey. And the people that he administered to ha have turned away from me. He did a lot of work in that area. When you read of his travels, uh, he did a lot of work in that area. Many came to faith through Christ, in Christ through him. And the ones who should have been there to support him didn't. They abandoned him. It may be that Paul requested character witnesses to appear on his behalf, but out of fear, none of them did. He was abandoned by those he loved the most. And uh, among those who abandoned him, he even mentions by name, are jealous and hermogenous. He says these are people, and more than likely, they were, they were obviously well known in the church there, and he's just calling them out. He's saying these people have abandoned me. Well, faithless ones have abandoned me, so let me encourage you to remain faithful. He goes on, though, to speak of Onesip Onesiphorus. The word Onesiphorus, the name, means bringing profit. This is a, an unknown believer, but Paul loved him. 
he loved him a lot. And Onesiphorus conquered his fear. And he even came to Paul to serve him, to refresh him. Somebody said his conduct is contrasted with that of Phygelus and Hermogenes, from whom Paul might well have expected to receive sympathy and help. They had turned away from him. Onesiphorus acted in a different way, not being ashamed of Paul's chain and visiting him often in order to minister to him. And so this is the kind of person that is used as an example. Let me give you four things in closing about service that you see in Onesiphorus. Four things, and we'll close with these four things. One, it's not just a one-time thing for him. He often refreshed Paul. He didn't minister to Paul one time and then leave it up to others to do. His ministry was long-term, and he didn't grow tired of serving. Second, in verse 16, he was not ashamed of Paul's chain. He understood the cost that Paul was paying for his faithfulness to Jesus Christ, and that was an incentive to him to remain faithful in service also. It says in verse 17, when he arrived in Rome, he sought me out very diligently and found me. So a third thing, he was sacrificial. He determined to complete the mission that he had been called to. As a servant, he actually scoured through the jail cells in Rome, looking for Paul. He didn't just go half-heartedly making an attempt and then leaving, saying, well, at least I tried. He continued looking until he completed his task. And then fourth, in verse 18, may the Lord grant to him that he might, may find mercy from the Lord on that day. A fourth thing, he was well known for being a servant in his home church in Ephesus, and he had a great reputation. He was known as a person with a servant's heart, and he was to find mercy from the Lord in that final day. In Hebrews 6.10, it says, God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which you have showed toward his name, in that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. Hold fast to the end, guys. Remain strong. We're living in a season, in a time, when the Christian gospel is ridiculed, Openly, believers are ridiculed openly. There is strong opposition to your faith and your beliefs. You can be intimidated. You can be made to feel ignorant, stupid, uneducated. This may, this may be encouragement to some, or some probably already think this anyway. There are a lot of people who think I'm stupid. But guess what? A long time ago, as a young believer, when I first got saved, I made a decision. My decision was, I'm going to try to know God through his word. I want to know not just what I believe, but I really want to know whom I have believed. This is eternal life, that they may know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent, John 17, 3. I want to know the Lord and haven't gotten to the point where I could say, and the fellowship of his suffering, but that is part of it. And so don't be ashamed, guys, of the gospel. Look out and see what people are proud of. Look at the marches, people with the banners, people standing up with the signs, marching for things that Jesus died to set them free from. And then the church is all quiet, like we're ashamed. Don't be ashamed of the gospel. Now, don't be a bully, and don't be arrogant, and don't go out picking fights, gospel fights. Don't do that. But don't be ashamed to be counted with Jesus Christ. He wasn't ashamed of you. Don't be ashamed of him. Don't be ashamed of him. Stand up. Stand up. Because I have discovered and am discovering that he never leaves me nor forsakes me. And I also know that there have been times when I've been on, on that, that hot spot, if you will, where people are pushing, where the Lord will give you words and wisdom which none of your enemies can gain, say, nor resist. It is the spirit of your father who speaks at that moment. And what I've learned to do is I've learned to just close my mouth and open my heart and say, God, when I speak, may your word go forth. And God is faithful to his word. 
If you're in a class as a college student, high school student, whatever, you're in a class, an office, and people are putting Jesus down, you don't have to stand up and start a fight. Just find an opportunity to speak to them and say to them something like, boy, you're angry about the Lord, huh? What happened in your life? Start a dialogue and a conversation. Why are you so mad? What happened? Why, you know, those stinking hypocrite Christians, they this and they that. Really? You know, and, and start a friendship and relationship in the sense of communicating with them. Talk to them. Open your heart to them. They probably haven't really ever met a real Christian in their life. Or the ones that they have encountered are cartoonish. They're not the real deal. That gives you an opportunity. I've had people who have liked me, but they didn't like Christianity. How do you do that? But when they like you, sometimes God uses that for a conversation where they say, well, you're different. You're different. And my thing is, no, I'm not. I'm just a Christian. And there are millions who love the Lord like I do, many millions. Now, I'm not different. I'm just a Christian. And you know, that's how it works, guys. Don't be ashamed of the gospel. Don't back down. I'm not saying, again, don't hit them with a holy elbow. I'm saying, just hold fast to what is true and watch what God will do. You will be blessed and surprised how God will use you to reach people. You will be so thrilled that you will be addicted to it. You're going to want to tell people about the Lord. That's what got me to be standing right here with you right now is I love talking about Jesus Christ because he sets the sinner free. Keep that in mind. That's the key.